Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rodolfo Lassi. I am the Environment Director here at the OECD. Welcome to today's uh, live uh, OECD Green Talk on the topic of blended finance for water-related investments. Water flows as a prerequisite through every one of the Sustainable Development Goals, especially those on food security, healthy lives, energy, sustainable cities, sustainable consumption and production, and marine and terrestrial ecosystems. This illustrates how interconnected the sustainable management of water resources is with major environmental challenges, such as steaming biodiversity loss, sustainable management of our oceans. There is also growing recognition of the crucial contribution of water-related investments to climate resilience and to delivery on the Paris Agreement. We need, indeed, a water, low-carbon water, and resilient infrastructure. Delivering these environmental ambitions will require a historic scaling up of financing for water-related investments. This requires using existing sources of finance more strategically, as well as mobilizing additional sources of capital. Thus, it is my pleasure to welcome Kathleen Dominique from the OECD Environment Directorate and Bivke Bartz Kala from the OECD Development Cooperation Directorate DCD to share key messages for our new report, Making Blended Finance Work for Water and Sanitation. This report was supported by the Swedish International Development Agency, SIDA, and we are very grateful for CDS contribution on consistent engagement over the course of uh, developing this work. Before starting the presentation, we will uh, first turn to Aie Jude, a Senior Counselor and Head of the Vision Financing for Sustainable Development at the OECD for introductory remarks. We'll then hear from Kathleen and Bivke uh, for about 20 minutes. Afterwards, there will be roughly half an hour for questions. For those today, you can send questions at any time to questions moderator in the chat section of the uh, WebEx screen, and I will convey them uh, to our team. Uh, this is your chance to really dig deeper into this subject. After the questions and answers, we will then hear from uh, Karin Lind. Program Manager, Specialist, uh, Guarantees and, and Catalytic Financing for Development, CEDA for brief closing remarks. So, without further ado, uh, Aye, please uh, take the floor. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Rodolfo. Uh, we talk about a crisis. Uh, we have over 2 billion people that are unable to access uh, safe drinking water. 4.5 billion people that cannot access safe sanitation. So this is really a global crisis. We believe that improving global access to water and sanitation, but also to manage the scarce resources of uh, water resources, will really impact all elements of sustainable development, including food security, clean energy, and, and ocean life. Now, coming from a development finance background, uh, we have unfortunately admitted that development finance plays an important role, but obviously these uh, flows are not sufficient uh, to address really the total financing needs and to achieve the 2030 agenda. So what we need is basic mobilization of other resources. And finance is, uh, we believe, a very effective tool, or can be an effective tool in mobilizing commercial finance. So the new report uh, that uh, Kathleen and, and Wiebke will present in more detail in a moment, making blended finance work for water and sanitation that we launched two weeks ago at the World Water Week provides insights both in terms of what has worked, outlines basically the potential that there still is in order to uh, these blended finance approaches to both a broader range of investment types and contexts, but also, I guess, to mobilize more resources than currently is the case. Now, as always, uh, there is a lack of evidence, so we need to further work on a stronger evidence-based to better understand the current as well as the potential role of commercial finance, and especially the blended finance models for water-related investments. 
Now, as I mentioned earlier, the relevance of the sector for multiple SDGs really shows that water and sanitation uh, investments can take a variety of forms and addresses a multiple uh, a multitude of different needs. So that's also the reason why in this publication we took a, a broader approach to water-related investments and a desk cover blended finance models that contribute to the achievement of the SDGs, including but not only limited to SDG 6. Now, as, as Rudolfo has been saying at the beginning, this is really a, a, a product, a very, very uh, a fruitful cooperation across uh, development actors uh, and, and water experts. So we, coming from a development cooperation perspective, teamed up with Rudolfo's team on the Environment Directorate and uh, especially the water team to basically leverage our comparative advantages and our comparative know-how in order to really have a very, very fruitful uh, conversation with uh, donors, official development finance providers, water experts, as well as commercial investors over a period of one year. And I think it goes without saying that this collaboration is really the, the, the report and its finding, and we would like to thank all of our partners who have contributed uh, to, to this report. Forward, uh, we have something that's called the Tree Hatagraf Rana Roadmap on Blended Finance. It's basically a mechanism that was launched in Bali last year to coordinate the excellent work from across uh, the, the sector, across the industry on blended finance. And basically, what we intend to do is to promote uh, good practice on blended finance, including also in the area of water and, and sanitation. But we also provide uh, uh, input into the OECD roundtable on financing uh, water, which brings together the OECD development experts, financiers, the aim to scale up financing for investments uh, that contribute then to water security and sustainable growth. Now, so you see that is what is needed is really is truly uh, work across different areas of expertise. Uh, we have to uh, go beyond the silos uh, as, as uh, almost always uh, in tackling these uh, intrinsically complex uh, problems comes to financing the SDGs and advancing the 2030 agenda. And therefore, we really look forward to continuing the dialogue, not least during uh, this excellent uh, Green Water webinar that we have today. And with that, over to you. Now, please, uh, Catherine, could you start the presentation? Absolutely. Um Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Rudolfo, and also Haye for those uh, introductory remarks to set the scene. Um, now it's our turn to help to present some of the key that came out of this work. This work was took um, over a year of quite intense collaborations among these two communities, the water experts and the, the blend of finance experts. And so let us, uh, without further ado, jump into some of the findings. The first is just to talk of the current state of play around the mobilization of private finance for the water sector. So this is some collected DCD, uh, the DCD team, um, that looks at the amount of uh, private finance mobilized by development finance over the period uh, from 2012 to 2017. What you can see there on the left side the, is a breakdown across sectors, and you can see uh, that supply and sanitation as a sector accounts for only a very, very small share of total private finance mobilized. On the right-hand side, see two rings there, and here what we see is a breakdown among, um, across different instruments that can be used in blended finance approaches. And on the outer, look at the general breakdown across uh, instruments according uh, for all sectors, and on the inner ring, you can see the breakdown across instruments for water supply and sanitation specifically. And what is uh, interesting to take away here is that in terms of the instruments that can be used on blended finance approaches, guarantees are very used account for almost 60% of the private finance supplies, followed by syndicated loans. This is another 29% of private finance. So what we see here is um, a clear message that um, the mobilization of private finance in the sector has been very limited to date. And that's something we've recognized that uh, water supply and sanitation, as well as water security investments have long relied on public finance. Um, 
also with a specific um, with, uh, development finance playing a very important role in, in developing countries. However, we, of course, we know that's not enough to reach the SDGs, uh, which is why we dug deeper um, research to understand what were really the barriers uh, of scaling up the mobilization of finance and what could bring us forward. Uh, to do this, we recognize that when we're talking about water related investments, we're actually talking about a broad range of investment types. Here we're interested in anything from water supply and sanitation uh, to water supply, uh, to investments in hydropower production, to irrigation, to flood protection. So it's really a very heterogeneous space. And so to get a better uh, focus on the different types of investments and the different risk return profiles those investments have, we selected three subsectors to dig deeper. And we chose those subsectors actually specifically because they really represented distinct uh, risk return profiles. They also had different levels of experience with blended finance to date, different levels of experience with um, different instruments. So it provided a nice basis for us to compare and contrast. Uh, experience to date. And what we chose were water supply and sanitation utilities, where most of the work around blended finance water space has, has focused on to date. So I wanted to contrast that with a little bit more of a difficult subsector uh, relating to small scale off grid sanitation. Of course, those are not mutually exclusive. You can have utilities delivering off grid sanitation, but off grid sanitation poses some uh, interesting challenges that uh, pose some questions. For the blended finance discussion. And then the third subsector is around multi water infrastructure. And here we're talking about infrastructure that can deliver a range of different benefits, usually cultural, can include energy production, water supply, flood control, et cetera. And alongside of that, we want to look at landscape based approaches, which are specific to a um, special area. Water is a very local resource. And so landscape based approaches have to zoom in on a combination of investments that are relevant for spatial scale. Sometimes those rely on nature-based solutions, which use ecosystems to deliver services. We took a case study approach in this work, and here's a map that just gives you a brief overview of the case studies that we collected. And here we're very grateful to all the partners that we consulted with and worked with over the course of the year, uh, who provided a lot of examples, concrete examples that we could document and analyze. Um, gives a, uh, an idea of the geographic uh, spread and also the different uh, subsectors that we investigated. And I'll just mention, we won't talk about these in much detail today during the webinar, but there's very detailed documentation of each of these case studies and the approaches that they use in the report. So I would encourage you to dig deeper on that. Now, this is um, a picture that gives us a kind of a high level view of the state of play of blended finance for water-related investments. And here we see um, quite a significant difference in terms of the stage of market evolution over time per subsector. So I mentioned uh, when we select these different subsectors, we did so because they presented interesting and different uh, contrasting um, perspectives in terms of the risk return profile that you can see for investments in those subsectors. And what you see all the way um, uh, toward the left of the scale is off-grid sanitation, which uh, in the cases that we documented has really mainly relied on grants and concessional and, and philanthropic uh, funding to date. And it, we've yet to see real commercial finance emerge. Then moving towards the right in terms of market evolution, where slowly we are um, mobilizing some finance and then more commercial finance, we see landscape-based approaches where we see some interesting examples where um, you have funding mechanisms that pool funding for public and private actors, but may not be mobilizing commercial finance yet. Um, then water supply and sanitation, where there's more experience in terms of tapping commercial finance, for certain investments in certain markets. And to the right is multipurpose water infrastructure, which successfully, in some of the cases, uh, mobilize commercial finance at scale. Now, we're going to go through a deep dive into each of these subsectors and just share with you some highlights in terms of key findings. Uh, I'm going to talk about the utilities perspective and then pass along uh, Vipka uh, to take us through the rest of the findings. In terms of utilities, we see that, of course, water and sanitation utilities have distinct needs when it comes to accessing finance, and usually there are not tailored commercial finance products on the market uh, for those utilities. In particular, they require long tenors, and they have to be able to spread out the 
um, their debt service payments over time while maintaining ability for users. That is a critical fact when we're talking about financing in this space, which is why oftentimes you don't see a match between the demand for finance on the utility side and what's offered on the market. Also, there are issues around credit worthiness on utilities, utilities and what we see is that blended finance strategies when well targeted can help utilities who are moving toward credit worthiness um, to improve their operational efficiency, re reduce non-revenue water, for example, but also improve their financial efficiency. And bit by bit with support, with concerted support of uh, technical assistance over time, these utilities can move towards credit worthiness. So what we find is that blended finance is suitable for parts of the market and certain geographies. It's not necessarily going to be one fit size fits all for all utilities. Uh, credit enhancement is, uh, can be a particularly important tool uh, that can improve the credit profile of investments. And in particular, guarantees are a very commonly used instrument, uh, which are effective in lowering the cost of capital by mitigating financial risk associated with those investments. I mentioned technical assistance uh, uh, now, but I want to reiterate that the role of technical assistance at the transaction level in blended finance models is a very important accompaniment measure cannot be underestimated and it's really relevant across the, the financing value chain so we see technical assistance playing a very important role combined with their instruments either for borrowers or for financiers or in the middle in terms of helping connect the supply and demand for finance in terms of project development now technical assistance takes time it takes concerted effort and uh, we think that uh, this is a very important point to or in this uh, domain. And finally, I'll just say a final word is uh, in the enabling environment. We really emphasize that the role of blended finance is not to replace a poor enabling environment. The enabling environment can help promote investment, whether this is the policy framework or the institutional arrange arrangements are, is a really fundamental primordial um, uh, dimension uh, that blended finance will not replace on its own. I'll just touch on this very briefly before uh, handing over the the mic to Vipka. Uh, this is one of the examples we documented in the utilities chapter. It's a Jamaica credit enhancement facility. Um, it may take you a few minutes to decipher this uh, figure, but there's a case study you can read about in the report. What's interesting here is that the National Water Commission put a surcharge in water users' bills called the K factor that was then earmarked to specifically finance investments um, in wastewater treatment and improving efficiency of the services. Now, they had a revenue stream, but it wasn't sufficient in terms of providing collateral to access commercial finance in Jamaica. So they used a, a grant from the Global Environment Facility, Caribbean Regional Fund. Uh, it's a $3 million grant that they put in a reserve fund that provides a guarantee uh, and they were able then to access 12 million in terms of um, commercial finance in order to fund these investments that are and that is then purposed in part by the K factor revenue. So this is a very interesting model that provided an, an access point to commercial finance. With that, I'd like to pass things over to Vipka, who's going to share with us the rest of the findings. Thank you, Kathleen, and welcome also from my side. So I'm going to take you through the other remaining two subsectors off-grid sanitation and multi-purpose water infrastructure and landscape-based approach before then go into some overarching policy implications and some next steps. So basically in terms of off-grid sanitation, as Lean already initially said, we looked into off-grid sanitation not as an alternative to large-scale infrastructure on grid um, systems, but as, an, um, as a complementary approach um, which is basically um, addressing gaps in that area. So basically off-grid sanitation is oftentimes uh, are provided by small scale innovative enterprises who come up with very, um, technologically advanced approach to, um, to providing sanitations like container based sanitation. At the same time, and this is here put on the slide, um, commercial investment is not yet taking place. And this is because of the structure of this. So there's a lot of these small businesses I mentioned just operating in that sector and they are very small and innovative. And this is nothing which is feeling from a commercial perspective because you need large-scale investments with a certain return on investment 
it's a bit of a mismatch between the very um, desirable development return, which also higher mentioned. So there's a need for sanitation services. At the same time, commercial investment on, under the circumstances we looked into uh, has not taken off. So what is happening in the sector is um, that um, a lot of uh, philanthropic actors are um, taking providing grant funding to, to small-scale enterprises and for technical assistance, as well as some um, uh, development agencies are operating in the sector, providing some concessional loans. Um, so not yet really the commercial investment perspective, uh, which we um, looked into in the potentially um, where we will end in the future. At the same time, um, we see that there are some opportunities to very much look at blended finance models that contain a concessional element. So you might uh, to um, blend it together with a more uh, commercial loan or with a concessional loan, which is not yet taken place, but we saw some opportunities for that and uh, developed that in the report. Switching that uh, model around, so we looked uh, into a small scale enterprises which provided sanitation service in order to access to sanitation services, but at the same time, you can also uh, flip it around and look into the households who can um, increase or get improved access to sanitation services when they have access to finance, which they then can use to basically buy um, sanitation assets or services. So this is uh, what we also looked into microfinance. So basically microfinance is lending to um, low income who then can use that money to um, access sanitation assets and services. And there you can see some models which are, um, and I will go into the detail when we have uh, um, we have the case study on the next slide, but there you see some models where potentially commercial investors or, and non-developmental investors can actually um, invest into sanitation ex um, services. Um, and this is uh, something which we also looked into. And then um, what we also see as a promise to potentially scale up commercial investment in the sanitation sector is to look into the supply, uh, supply chain or the value chain of sanitation services. Of course, you have the sanitation, the provision of sanitation services on the one side, but then of course there's also a waste collection side as well as the treatment side of, in, in the sanitation supply chain. So what we often see is that all these uh, different parts are separated, but there might be um, a potential role for blended finance with some concern element to look into the supply chain of sanitation as a whole and overcome some some barriers to um, to accessing external commercial financing and then finally just quickly um, I, what we also saw is that in particular when it comes to the um, waste treatment side and self for instance of uh, um, fertilizer which is uh, has been produced out of uh, the waste um, there's some issues around uh, the regulatory environment which doesn't which prevents uh, uh, the the use of uh, basically the waste to 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 use it for fertilizers. So that's something where actually the regulation regulatory side can also look into in order to to scale these enterprises and small enterprises which are operating in the sanitation sector. Ultimately, then um, a more viable business opportunity from a commercial investor perspective. And then just. An example, and Kathleen mentioned that we had a case study approach, and for off grid sanitation, the case studies we looked into, we couldn't really see commercial finance uh, from the, into that sector scale, but we saw some promising examples. And one of them is um, actually this example in India with water.org, which is an NGO um, channeling philanthropic funding towards uh, sanitation in order to improve and increase access to sanitation services. And it's, um, so, uh, water.org is actually um, a promoting and funding the, um, the microfinance approach I mentioned about. So they work with microfinance institutions in India, provide technical ins assistance to M microfinance institutions which are already operating and borrowing to low-income borrowers. We use the technical assistance to work with them to set up dedicated loan programs for sanitations, to provide uh, education material for the borrowers in order um, to help um, the access to sanitation services so that households can actually afford these um, in the first place and then pay back when they received from the microfinance institution. So there is some model where we see microfinance in general has already attracted commercial finance at scale. And this is a potential also for microfinance for sanitation service to go into that sector. Um, the next um, slide is basically going into the last sector, which is multipurpose water infrastructure and landscape based approaches. So really the other extreme uh, of project sizes. Um, as Kathleen said, we, we mixed the two because the two multipurpose water infrastructure and landscape-based approaches provide uh, multiple benefits across sectors, agriculture, energy, as you will see. 
um, and landscape based approaches in particular are looking into um, given spatial areas and try to make um, leverage the whole landscape and the stakeholders operating in the landscape. So, multi purpose water and and we treat them separately here on the slide. Um, Multipurpose water infrastructure, we see, we see a lot of um, models where blended finance is already mobilizing commercial investment at scale into um, multipurpose water infrastructure projects. So we have a lot of examples in the report and the reason being that infrastructure per se um, is a, a model run on oftentimes on special purpose vehicles, pro, uh, uh, PPPs as well. So this is a model where the commercial actor is already familiar with from more OECD countries from other sectors. So this is something where we see this works quite well also in the multipurpose water infrastructure sector, despite of course, a lot of uh, challenges related to that set, that sector in terms of funding of projects, for instance. Um, what we also see is there's a huge need for technical assistance as well. I mean, you have projects which run up to 30 years uh, and you need to anticipate all the social and environmental um, impacts which are associated with these large scale projects. Um, to name one of the uh, reasons why there's a lot of resources, um, and time and costs associated with project development. So technical assistance is very important for multi-purpose water infrastructure in order to unlock commercial finance. So in terms of landscape-based approaches, um, what we basically looked into is uh, how landscape-based approaches so that basically um, take into account the whole landscape uh, into project development and project finance uh, can be financed with commercial finance. And just to summarize, I think that's very early stage. What we see is basically that more and more development actors and IDB have been one example um, are getting into um, the landscape based approaches in, in terms of their project development um, uh, phase. And then we see also some examples where already commercial actors or grant funding from commercial actors in the field for instance, with the water funds model in Latin America has been mobilized. So there's already some um, partnership with the commercial side um, and there might be potential to scale um, or to mobilize and unlock commercial finance, but yet at this stage it's not happening. So this was basically the summary of the subsector. And here we have one example um, multi-purpose water infrastructure model, which is operating in um, Uganda. And there you have basically an example where the whole private infrastructure development group, so PIT, um, is operating as it's a funded uh, um, investment group which is operating across the supply, the the, the um, life cycle of infrastructure investments from development phase to the operation of where the pitch group is actually going into a multi-purpose water infrastructure project where uh, in Uganda, basically, the, there's an upgrade of a road, there's an upgrade of an introduction of ferries this uh, power generation system, there's a water supply, uh, water supply system being upgraded. So it's really multi-purpose and it's funded by a combination of development finance mobilizing that bank, which is uh, providing a loan guaranteed by USAID and familiar phases in the development world in order to, to provide better services for, um, to, for the, uh, for the uh, in, in Rwanda in that area of Kalangala. To more depths in the uh, report, but I will for the last couple of minutes, uh, more, maybe only just more two more minutes, policy implications. And there, um, I think what uh, the report actually shows that that is that um, blended finance again, and uh, we have seen that in other instances, uh, blended finance is not making up. For non-working business model. It's not a solution which can make up for a missing regulatory environment. So blended finance is a transaction model and you need to invest and you need to put efforts uh, also in the enabling environment to make to make commercial investment more uh, substantially coming in into the water and sanitation sector. And then I maybe pick out two more lessons learned. So um, the three is basically the idea is that there are great models out there in terms of blended finance which are working. So we need to look at them, we need to digest the lessons learned and apply them to other contexts and conditions. We don't need to reinvent the wheel time from scratch. So we can definitely look into models that work and this repo is actually doing exactly this. Um, so what we see and what is needed in the water sector, we need an exit strategy. So Bennett Finance is not there um, to be there forever. It should be just um, unlocking commercial finance. It should build track record for commercial investors. It should enable um, the self-sustainable market, market and not forever. And so we see that there are some great examples of exit strategies of commercial 
of blended finance and development finance in particular, when there's a subsidy involved, are in, involved in the or already built into the model. And so we see that need, needs to be happening more structurally. And finally, we need more coordination, not only at the transaction level, but in particular when there are subsidies involved in financing water and sanitation, then also at the donor level, at the common act level, at the provider level, there needs to be coordination across, um, across the transaction in order to make sure that the markets uh, are fostered and commercial finance is fostered. And then speaking of coordination, there are two vehicles in the OECD where we actually coordinate on a regular basis, and how you mentioned that speech so there will this report will be an output of the tree takarana roadmap of planet finance um, thk much easier um, where we discuss how planet finance can be scaled and which bottlenecks are there and which need which need to be removed so this will be fed in that process and being discussed there as well and the same for the round table on financing water where um so it's coming together the next time in asia um hosted by adb in order to discuss the outcomes of the report. And now I'm stopping here and look forward to your question. Well, thank you very much, Natalie and Pique. Uh, I think that we learned uh, about water, uh, finance and investment. New word for me, three Hita Karana roadmap, <laughs> no? the credit enhancement guarantees for blend and finance, uh, technical assistance and pooling mechanisms, enable a more transparent environments for water investment. Extreme Regulations, we need those. Uh, microfinance, implicit revenue streams, that's very interesting. And exit strategies, much more better <laughs> than being uh, stuck in, in some uh, projects. Uh, please, uh, now this is the, the time to do questions. Uh, we have here experts uh, from, from different institutions and different uh, directories from OECD. So who is uh, in the first question? Hannah, please. Thank you, Rodolfo. Hannah Lee, I'm in directorate. Um, so we heard from, from Haya in the opening remarks about, you know, the crisis of sanitation and, and uh, the 4.5 billion that are lacking access. And a lot of those will be in rural areas. So um, can you share a little bit more about do, um, with how, how blended finance can help to scale up off-grid sanitation? Well, for these specific questions we have here, because we invite him, Patrick Doherty is uh, connected by internet. He's not. Oh. So uh, perhaps uh, uh, Kathleen can answer the question, please. So well, um, on, on sanitation, I think that's a very important question because we actually haven't seen um, commercial finance. And I'm, I'm, I will only give a small introduction because I understand that I'm like, Hello. Oh, hi. Sorry, sorry. sorry. For some reason, I, I was muted. Um, I already just the answer, but I'm handing over to you now and to turn off my microphone. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, so yes, uh, as uh, my colleagues discussed previously, um, Blended finance has played a limited role in the off-grid sanitation sector so far, and that is due to sort of um, small enterprise operating in area and new technologies. So if you're looking at fecal sludge management uh, and things like that. But that said, as uh, alluded to previously, blended finance, uh, concession finance in particular, can play a role to help build local markets. Um, so that's so far grant funding being uh, blended with DFIs to actually generate long-term uh, investment opportunities for commercial finance in the long run. Um, so just um, to give some examples, there are some examples of uh, industry financial mechanisms currently being explored uh, in terms of development impact bonds. So one of our case studies um, looking at the towns of Y and Sinar, um, where Bill and Linda Gates Foundation and SEP University essentially um, implemented a scheduled sludging program. <clears throat> and basically the success of this model is currently being explored um, on impact bonds. So SEP University is exploring with uh, social finance the potential for a development impact bond to scale up a scheduled sludging one. And so this is just one example of it. And then as, as alluded to previously about microfinance, um, so blending models such as you know loans and credit lines to MFIs can increase demand for sanitation services and assets um, and help scale that. And you know, there's uh, watch.org again uh, have a water equity program, so a fund manager which frankly which looks at the purpose of mobilizing commercial capital for water and sanitation uh, finances and enterprises will deal to 
of you know funding MFIs with commercial capital to uh, increase access to water sanitation for households. That said, blended finance is not a silver bullet, um, so it's just it's one tool in the development toolkit. And importantly, it can't replace business models that don't have a clear revenue proposition. Um, and I would just re-emphasize again what colleagues stressed about conducive regulatory environment. This particular holds for grid sanitation, um, where in some instances, uh, in terms of uh, the end product or the reuse, sale of reuse products from sleek or sludge management, has been unable to be sold on by enterprises operating in the area um, because there's no policy environment that currently exists there. Um, yes, so I would emphasize the importance of environment working with local governments. In the case that is undertaken, some success stories have been working with municipalities and state governments, as is the case with the, the, the wine scenario example, where it's actually implemented with a sanitation tax um, by the local government. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Well, we have some questions from the audience. Uh, Gaetan uh, Susanet uh, is asking by, uh, of greed. Uh, do you mean decentralized sanitation? If so, your key findings are interesting because there are technological solutions being developed to address decentralized sanitation solutions. Finance will therefore be required. So interesting to see the Indian example. Could you mention something about it? Great. Uh for that question, Gayatan, hello. I'm glad to see you join the webinar. Um, it, you're, you're quite right to flag that there are a lot of technical, uh, technological solutions being developed. So this is a rapidly moving landscape. Um, they absolutely do need financing. The other interesting thing we see in the off-grid, non-sewered sanitation space is the development of innovative business models. So that's another reason we selected that subsector because there's a lot of activity, there are a lot of new there's a lot of innovation and there's a lot of things happening on the ground. So we want to see to what extent commercial finance might be being mobilized in that sector. And in fact, it's true the technologies are very interesting, but they also can provide additional risk in terms of those investments because some of those technologies are not proven, etc. But if, as we say, this is a moving landscape. What is very interesting, as Wipka mentioned, are technologies that um, are not just about the, um, the collection of, of, of waste and the sanitation service per se, but the technologies that then uh, translate that into that waste into energy or products. And that, that's where you see a revenue stream emerging, and that's where you see a potential pathway towards accessing commercial finance. Um, maybe Wipka, if you'd like to add a few words on that. Yeah, I think um, the most important thing is really the revenue streams because we took this commercial investor view and like in order to be really okay, sustainable over the long run, uh, sufficient uh, revenue stream is needed. We also saw and mentioned the Indian model in, in your question, but and also Patrick mentioned it just now, we saw that if the government, for instance, comes in and also um, some concession to, to these off-grid sanitation service providers that could also work as a stable source of revenue. So there are different models. Um, um, where how actually um, these enterprises can be scaled and uh, achieve a larger group of low income households. So we have looked into that and um, these are just a couple of ideas how, how that could work in the future. Sorry, can I just uh, add one further thing? Um, so just in, in, sorry, in terms of um, if you're talking about new technologies and container based sanitation enterprise, actually, despite a number of them being in operation for a number of years, they're actually that the revenues don't cover the cost. So these aren't profitable enterprises currently, and they're very much reliant on grant funding. And it's about getting the sale for the end products, as Kathleen was, uh, you know, insinuated before, um, to sale on real use products where potential revenue streams are. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, now uh, we have a question from Portugal. Uh, Antonio Branco is asking, is there any kind of funding for actions intended to tackle water scarcity? Uh, hello, Portugal. Uh, excellent that you could join us. I would say indeed that this work looks very much at the wide range of, of water related investments that we could imagine. And of course, to uh, better manage water scarcity is part of that. Um, of course, you have a number of different options to manage scarcity. It depends on the context, but of course, managing demand is also an important part, but also investing in expanding supply, improving the efficiency of the delivery of the service, reducing leakage, reducing um, non-revenue water is also very important. And so these investments are 
um, certainly part of this discussion. Um, you see a variety of different things. We have a case studies that dig into that uh, that are that are in the report. I don't have the time to go into them now. But I would definitely encourage you to have a look. This is definitely part of the part of the scope. Now we have here a very interesting question from Stephen Porter. Blending finance is intended to reduce finance risk to a commercially acceptable level to attract private sector providers of finance. What are the OECD's thoughts on how to minimize the moral hazard the private sector pursues a ever lower risk for a guaranteed reward? Example, excess benefit accrued to the private sector without corresponding risk acceptance? Very good question and going far beyond the water and sanitation sector and the questions on the which we are dealing with um, on the development coordination side on the blended finance team um, at the moment as well. Um, in, in order to really bring some good practice to the blended finance sector, the development assistance committee, um, the 30 donor countries which we are working with, um, have endorsed the OECD blended finance principles in 2017, um, which actually provides some some guidance and some good. This is also around um, questions of additionality. So, how you can you be as a actor, as a commercial lender, um, mobilizing um, commercial finance be additional in the context of the private sector, um, which is basically the ultimate question of not to over subsidize um, the private sector, not to crowd out the private sector. So, there is some guidance on this. And at the moment, um, what we are developing is basically a handbook or guidance on these planet finance principles to provide governments and to provide development actors a handbook and, and some ideas around how that could look like in practice. And then there are questions around which factors you have to monitor in order to develop that over the long, uh, to, to uh, monitor that deal and better understand how the market evolves. And might there might be no commercial finance at this moment, but there might be in two years because that's the idea of planet finance. As we have seen also with the with the um, market evolution graphic, which Kathleen introduced earlier. So the, all these questions are more on a structural level, and we um, in, in the development cooperation directorate are tackling these at the moment in water and sanitation, but certainly relevant for water and sanitation as well. Hi, to add something. Just, just to say that really at the center is more transparency. This report is very much about digging into the data, but also featuring uh, uh, case studies. Just uh, to say that uh, both when it comes to the guidance note, we are developing uh, uh, pinning the OECD DAC blended finance principles, but also the data Karana roadmap. Uh, a key part of both is more transparency, and we're working together with our friends and colleagues from development finance institutions, uh, from the multilateral development banks, uh, with CSOs, uh, think tanks, our from donor agencies in order to gather more data and make these uh, results of this data publicly available so that questions like the one uh, can be raised really on an evidence basis. Thank you. Now, I, I would like to ask the audience here in the room if we want to do some questions. If not, let me go uh, to another question from Stephen Senna. Uh, He's saying, regarding exit strategies, considering that even in OECD countries, the majority of funding and finance for water and sanitation infrastructure comes from the public sector, are you looking to replace the donor blend with domestic public sector investment while continuing to leverage uh, this with commercial sources? You referring to something else. I can start and then Colleen can also chip in um, later. So that's a, also a very good question. So I think when we have thought about where we want to go with the market evolution thing, then there you still see a role for, for public finance in, in the water and sanitation sector. That's correct. So this is an essential service and there is a role to for public finance and for um, donor finance as well in developing countries. At the same time, uh, we always emphasize that blended finance is just one tool in the toolbox of development finance actors. So there are still all these fun other opportunities and other ways to fund infrastructure and water projects, for instance, just by public public budgets and um, the like. So blended finance shouldn't be the one solution which comes into play in water and sanitation. It's just one among many other. 
also um, relies on, on public finance and there will always be a role to play. And I just might add, uh, thanks for the question, uh, Stefan. Um, I fully agree that public finance has historically played an important role. It will in the future. We do know that budgets are very constrained. So we are looking at ways to mobilize additional finance. That does not necessarily imply that you would move to commercial finance eventually. It will have to be the blend for the right context and the right investment. However, I would like to also emphasize that a very important um, finding I think came out of this work, a message that came out of this work is that blended finance is not just about a mobilizing small financing for the sector. There's also a very important market building role that blended finance can play. I'm not sure if we emphasize that in, as much in our, enough in our presentation. The point is, is that um, the water sanitation sector for many years has relied on concessional finance public finance, and with that, sometimes there is not as much accountability or um, efficiency in terms of the ways investments are made, et cetera. And what we do see is that some commercial finance into the mix can help to actually strengthen the overall financing systems on which those investments rely. It brings additional accountability, can bring additional transparency, can bring um, credit ratings, for example. Uh, and so all of these mechanisms are very important. And so I just want to emphasize that we're not only concerned about filling a, a financing gap or funding gap, uh, but it's also about thinking about how we're using the funding, how funding is deployed, and what are the incentives or disincentives that come with those funding streams. Thank you very much. Uh, we are receiving a lot of questions, so let me take uh, another one uh, from Bill Kingdom. You see two strengths to blend in finance. Firstly, to keep a borrowing cost affordable to those utilities with sufficient free cash flow, allowing them to borrow and start to build relationships between utilities and lenders. And secondly, to provide comfort to lenders to marginally credit worthy borrowers, for example, those with inadequate and unpredictable DSC through guarantees, for example. <laughs> Bill, um, excellent question. That's a very, very precise and well-designed question. It shows that you know a lot about the topic. I definitely say um, yes to, to both friends. One is about keeping bar borrowing costs um, affordable, uh, and the other is assisting. I didn't catch the last, the second point. Uh, so blended finance can have a role to play in terms of um, helping to to start the transition towards commercial finance. So there you can in terms of borrowing costs, but also at the same time build a track record. You talk about the relationship between the borrowers and lenders can build a performance track record, uh, for the lenders and also some comfort in terms of commercial lenders who may not have much experience in the sector. So this is something we uh, mentioned in the presentation about the role of technical assistance and also using some grant financing um, to build up the um, the whole financing chain in the sector. So this is working with the lenders, the commercial players who may not have specific products or vehicles well adapted to the sector, may not know the sector. There may be a gap, but a very strong gap between perceived risk of the sector and actual risk. So those are important factors to consider. Then helping with technical assistance on the on the borrower side, or of course joining those up. The second part of the question, I'm sorry. I'm could you repeat? Yes. Uh, to provide comfort to lenders to marginally credit wealthy borrowers, those with an inadequate or unpredictable CR. Okay. Um, okay. So this is so we talk about borrowers. We talk a lot about how borrowers need to be credit worthy in order to have a market, but uh, have access to commercial finance. But we see also blended finance can be a useful tool for those who are moving. Toward Credit worthiness. So it's not necessarily only those who are already credit worthy, but be a tool for help them, those who are credit worthy or moving towards. Um, indeed, I think you're talking about then the the uh, the ratio of revenue that they have vis-a-vis uh, -vis their costs and what they can uh, uh, provide in terms of um, credit worthy uh, um, uh, evidence to potential lenders. So indeed, I think these are important features that you that you highlight. Uh, Cyril, are, uh, sorry, Cyril Arnold is, is saying uh, 
finance is not solely about debt. It is also, and perhaps more importantly, about equity financing. No equity leads to no debt. What is your reaction to that, that statement? It's, um, so uh, we haven't brought up that slide, but um, the finance uh, definition, of course, is much broader than debt. Of course, a lot of uh, examples, um, which we now also present, which uh, refer to debt financing, but an equity investment, like an anchor investment uh, by a development actor in a utility or in, in a fund structure will always uh, have this mobilization effect, and this uh, signaling effect about the structure and providing some buffer. Um, some risk cushion for the private investor, for the commercial investor to come in, to come after. And equity as such, of course, is uh, very important um, in a setting, and we didn't have the time to go into detail, but in a, a setting where, for instance, in off-grid sanitation, um, so they are small scale, they are high, highly risky, so they're obviously not um, yet, or not at large scale, um, um, equipped to, pro to have a huge uh, debt service capacity. So there's a, a role for, for equity to play in these enterprises where a patient investor comes in and takes the risk and helps together with the small enterprises towards scale in the future. The model, but obviously a very strategic role to play for equity. At the same time, of course, uh, we have higher transaction costs. Exit strategies are need to be well better well through, and you need to observe the market in order to to get out of an ex uh, equity deal. Which is uh, much more challenging than for debt, but um, there there's a lot of uh, role to play for equity, and also of course gra um, uh, guarantees and guarantees are the most used uh, blended finance model, which we see in our data. Guarantees are a huge role in comfort to commercial investors by reducing their cost of capital by reducing the risk actually they are exposed to. So there are a lot of instruments which go beyond the debt um, and which play an important role in blended finance. Okay, we have a, a final questions from Africa. Sianda Mpakama is asking, in Africa, we see a very high level of donor finance dependency in the water sector as public finance is generally not ad adequate. Crowding in commercial finance will require a higher level of accountability from water service suppliers. Is there political willingness from governments to improve on the enabling environment, understanding that they will have to be more transparent and accountable? How can the use of blended finance improve the financial and operational efficiencies of water service providers? Zianda, excellent questions again. Um, see, the question you ask around the, the of governments to really strengthen the enabling environment and I think it's an excellent question. As a natural optimist, I would say I certainly hope so. Uh, we certainly have, there's a lot of attention uh, to the financing gap in this sector, uh, Africa, but globally as well. And I do think you see some certainly positive signs from some governments on the continent who are, are serious about, uh, very serious about this issue and realize that there you know, policies, regulations, a good enabling environment needs to be in place. Now, of course, you can have a willingness, those reforms don't necessarily materialize overnight. So um, that requires, of course, concerted effort in terms of a reform path, finding ways to deal with affordability issues, ways to expand services, ways to use existing finance uh, much more strategically and efficiently. The second part of the question I just quickly touch on, because I think it's we've talked about it a little in the discussion, but how can blended finance improve the operational financial um, um, efficiency of borrowers? And this is very important, but what we typically see is that blended finance models are a financing structure and instruments and mechanisms that are all very often combined with technical assistance that can help borrowers um, improve the state of play of their accounting, uh, reduce inefficiencies in terms of operation. The blended finance Access, accessing commercial finance can also free up for investments that may be made, a G network and um, a very inefficient network, uh, moving towards more energy uh, efficient uh, sources and, and find savings in that way. On the financial front, I think an important factor, which we mentioned already as well, is bringing greater accountability in terms of the way the financing is used. Um, credit rating, uh, performance track record, use of finance, et cetera. So those are important uh, factors. And, and as mentioned, the blended finance can 
uh, and including the technical assistance that we often see very typical uh, as something integrated as part of those blended finance packages, if you will. Okay, thank you very much. Well, now I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Karin Lindvalland uh, from the Swiss um, International Development Agency, SIDA, uh, to provide us uh, final remarks, summarizing the key highlights and takeaways. Please, Karin. Are you there? Okay. Good Thank afternoon you. and morning, everyone. Thank you so much for allowing me having the uh, the last word here. We're very excited at CIDA about this uh, study um, because of, and we're excited because of the learning process that we've gone through with both the water community and the blended finance and and uh, commercial um, community. We um, because of its potential to bring the different competences. Uh, and knowledge to work for the development and bringing change for people living in poverty. So we financed and participated uh, in this process for three reasons. So firstly, we are in violent agreement that we need more actors and more capital to work in the field of water and sanitation services. And we also thought that we have to have a piece of evidence to show us what can be done and to inspire and challenge us and other actors in this field. Lastly, we need to foster these new and old partnerships uh, so that governments at all levels, NGOs, knowledge and networks, academia and private sector to work with the different pockets of the financing community locally, regional and globally. This report is part of our work in the development agency to develop and put into practice. So you've heard about the Trihata Karana. This is one piece where we're engaged with the broader community around to bring blended finance into thematic areas, real and hands on for us all. So let's uh, I just encourage this crowd of uh, more than 100 participants in this webinar with us and the OECD to uh, whenever you see us comment and make sure to support us to challenge some of the findings you know let's make it possible to attract commercial investments on nature-based and landscape approaches let's find ways to secure long -term and local commercial fund finance for utilities at scale and lastly let's foster a pipeline for innovations and business ideas the capital to work for local sanitation services. So that's my uh, wrap up. Uh, I want to thank OECD. You've shown uh, an excellent cooperation between uh, between your two uh, arms of, of of work, and I'm really part of this process. And thanks also for many of you who participated today and who have participated along with us over the last year. So there's a lot of possibilities and uh, thank you so much and let's go to work. <laughs> yes, for sure. Thank you, Karen. Uh, well, uh, please uh, follow the work that we are doing on blended finance for water and sanitation infrastructure. Please download the report. This is the highlight, uh, these are the highlights, uh, but we will soon uh, release the, the full report. And we will have, uh, let me remind you, uh, the round table on financing water in Manila in November. So please attend the meeting or follow the things that we are doing on Twitter, Facebook, and many other social media that we have here at UHD. Thank you very much indeed for, for, for your patience, for, for all the questions you did, and for your attendance today. Bye-bye.